Welcome back to Sanford Flip Math. This is AP Calculus. We are working our way through the calculus book by Finney Domanowitz Kennedy and the uh, AP Calculus curriculum. We are uh, into chapter six, which is about differential equations. Last uh, uh, last video was about slope fields. This week, or this video rather, excuse me, we're going to focus on uh, really uh, analytically looking at how to solve differential equations. Remember, differential equation is basically any equation that has derivatives or differentials involved. <clears throat> and the solution to a differential equation is the corresponding equation that doesn't have derivatives, that gives us you know, that same original equation for derivative. So slope field was just a technique to get a picture of what the solution would look like it, and that's especially useful when uh, antiderivatives are difficult to do. Today we're going to focus on this video. We're going to focus on uh, how to get uh, the equation analytically. So in other words, symbolically, working with the variables and stuff. So, And we did a little bit of this back in 6.1a at the beginning uh, to kind of emphasize the goal. And uh, in this case, we're going to focus specifically on the whole antiderivative thing. Okay, so the goal is... Uh, goal, sound it out, uh, is y equals, and uh, we want no y primes, no dy dx, okay, no anything that's about derivative, okay, that, that's the goal, <clears throat> okay. Now, initially what we need to do is separate variables, uh, and this will become more important later, uh, but we're going to establish the habit now, and <clears throat> it's basically anything about x is going to stay on one side, anything about y is going to stay on the other side of the equal, equal sign. So I'm going to multiply both sides by dx, okay, and so this becomes dy equals e to the x dx. Now again, my goal is to not have anything about derivatives, and that whole little d thing is all about derivatives. So I'm going to do the antiderivative of both sides. Now we've already discussed that the integral ultimately ends up being virtually synonymous with antiderivative. It really means area. But <clears throat> this symbol, without any limits of integration, <clears throat> excuse me, is called an indefinite integral. Indefinite integral. And so what it does is kind of preps us for doing area if we have, have some uh, limits of integration. Uh, an indefinite integral ultimately just ends up being antiderivative. So we use those terms kind of interchangeably. <coughs> Derivative. There it is. Okay. Um, so not sweating the limits here. All we're going to do is undo derivative. Well, the derivative, antiderivative, excuse me, antiderivative of dy is y. And I think we mentioned on the last video, technically there would be a constant that could be added here. As I do antiderivative of e to the x, well, what do you do the derivative of to get e to the x? I mean, that's our mindset, and it is e to the x. If you recall, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And I'd have a different constant. Now, I never write what I'm writing right now. I just want to be clear here. <clears throat> if I solve this for y, this becomes e to the x plus C2 minus C1. These are the two constants. And the idea here is that, you know, if I take a constant and subtract off a constant, isn't that just a constant? So we don't make a big stink out of both of them. We just only write one of them. And that is uh, the solution. Eight. Well, this represents how many different solutions for this <coughs> differential equation. So here, here's my original differential equation. This is my solution for the differential equation. But technically, this isn't a solution. This is technically lots of solutions. And again, the reason is is because this constant could take up take on any value. And when I take, <clears throat> if I wanted to show that this was in fact a solution, I could just do the derivative. So dy dx. The derivative of e to the x is, you guessed it, e to the x. The derivative of this constant, regardless of what constant it is, is 0. And so that's back to what I originally started, dy dx equals e to the x. Okay. Okay, well, a slightly different problem. This was solve the differential equation. Slightly different problem is solve the initial value problem. Well, this problem, please note, initially, pardon the pun, is, is the same problem. 
Okay, here's dy dx equals e to the x. Here's dy dx equals e to the x. The only distinction is that we have an initial value. An initial value just means some kind of a starting point. Some kind of a value that tells us where this graph needs to be. Okay, so uh, just to, again, make a, a big stink out of this, if I were to graph y equals e to the x, it looks pretty much like that. Okay, if I were to graph y equals e to the x plus 1, it looks pretty much like that. If I were to graph y equals e to the x minus 1, it's going to look pretty much like that. Okay, now, so the idea is that how do I know which one to pick? Well, back here I didn't know. Well, now I do. This says when I start, it goes through the point 0, 5. <clears throat> so that's going to help me. Okay, so process-wise, this looks exactly the same as what I just did. In fact, uh, I'm not going to spend my life doing this. I'm just going to fill it in. And ta-da, there it is. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we'll find out what C is. So this is an x value, this is a y value. I'm just going to put this together. So y equals e to the x plus c. Okay, now check yourself here. e to the 0 power is what? So c is 4. So the actual solution for this initial value problem is that. And really, that, that's all there is to it. You're just going to do an antiderivative, separate the variables, do an antiderivative, and go back and solve for C if you need to. Okay? All right, let's do another one. <clears throat> Ooh, this looks like fun. Okay, you guessed it. Separate the variables. On everything about, in this case, A on one side, and everything about X on the other. And if I didn't mention it, I think I did. Uh, I think most of these examples are coming out of the, the book that we use, the Finney Demand Awaits Kennedy book. Okay? All right, so I don't want the Ds. So we're going to do antiderivative. Antiderivative of dA is A. On the other side, well, this is going to be 10x to the 10 over 10. Okay, and I know you're going to simplify that, and I will too in a minute. So this will be 5x to the add 1 to the exponent. 4 plus 1 is 5, divided by the new exponent, minus 2x to the second over 2, plus 4, don't forget the x, and a constant. Okay. Well, technically, I could be done. Uh, I'm so, I have solved the differential equation. I have found lots of, ooh, I saw it. You saw it, didn't you? Uh, lots of potential solutions here because of the plus c could take on different values. Uh, I'm going to call this x to the 10th plus x to the fifth minus x squared plus 4x plus c. Okay, that plus c is a big deal. <clears throat> if you, every time, you know, if, if this is something you forget on the test, this, you'll lose a point every single time. If there's supposed to be a c, make sure you put the c. You will not be happy if you didn't. I know it seems like such a little deal, but it's a big deal, and they make a big deal out of it on the, on the AP test, so we have to be careful. Okay? All right, so we're going to do the corresponding, a corresponding initial value problem with this, and we'll just keep doing that. <clears throat> so it's the exact same problem. Okay? 10x to the 9th plus 5x to the 4th minus 2x plus 4. The only distinction is I'm giving you an initial value. I'm telling you an ordered pair, 1, 6, and we need to find C. <clears throat> so again, I'm not going to redo this whole thing. Uh, so A equals, so I'm just going to grab this. Okay, A equals 10 times x to the 9th plus 5 times x to the 4th minus 2 times x plus, oh, uh, you know what I'm doing? Whoops, back up. I was looking at the equation and not the antiderivative. All right, got to look up here. Thank you. Whew, I know somebody was over there going, what's Mr. Sanford doing? All right, so 1 to the 10th, that's better. Uh, plus 5 times 1, oh, did it again, stop it, sorry, uh, plus 1 to the 5th minus 1 squared, all right, here we go, plus 4 times 1 plus C, 
Oh, Sanford was having a little bit of an issue there. <clears throat> so now I need to solve for C. Okay, so 6 equals 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 4. Uh, a little more combining of like terms. Uh, 5 plus C. Okay, and so let's go one more step. Got to put it all together. So Y equals, okay, I need to look up above. Okay, so X to the 10th plus X to the 5th minus X squared plus 4X plus 1. Okay, just a little highlight just for kicks and giggles. <coughs> all right. Alrighty then, let's do another. Ooh, this looks nice. And by nice, I mean hideous. Okay. Alright, um, again, we're going to do the same idea. We're going to separate variables. So, dy equals 5 secant squared x minus 3 halves square root of x times dx. And we'll do a little antiderivative action here. So, y equals... Well, when I do the antiderivative of 5 secant squared, well, the antiderivative, the 5 is just a number that's being multiplied. I can kind of pull it out in front of the antiderivative. Uh, so I'm just going to say 5 times what? Well, what's the, what did I take the derivative of to get secant squared? So you're going to really want to remember all of that, you know, stuff from Chapter 3. I know it seems like 100 years ago. Okay, So I've done antiderivative here, minus. Now, again, 3 halves just a number that's coming along. Now when I do the antiderivative of this, I'm going to think of this as x to the 1 half. So when I actually do the antiderivative of this power function, I have to add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Plus c. Don't forget the plus c. As soon as you've done antiderivative, plus c needs to come in. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so y equals 5 times tangent of x. That part's pretty easy. And I'm actually pretty much done. Um, I can actually, you know, I, I normally would do something a little fancier with this. It'll multiply by the reciprocal kind of thing, but I'm just going to divide out that common factor here, if that's all right. Okay, so this just becomes minus x to the 3 halves plus c. Now, if you feel the urge to write that x to the 3 halves as the square root of x to the third or the square root of x to the third, that's fine. But that's good so far. Okay. Well, and that's it for solve the differential equation. Okay. Now, of course, I, I stuck a little value in here. Okay. So we're going to do the same exact problem again, only we're going to really find C. Okay. So substituting in, now again, this is an ordered pair, 0, 7. <coughs> substituting in, I have 7 for Y equals 5 times the tangent of 0 minus 0 to the 3 halves plus c. Well, tangent of 0, the slope at a 0 degree angle, actually happens to be 0. So this is 7 equals 5 times 0 minus, well, 0 to any power, except 0 to the 0, is in fact 0. So really, this is just 7 equals c. Okay, so ultimately what we end up with is y equals, or f of x equals 5 tangent of x minus x to the 3 halves. Again, there are other ways to write the three, x to the 3 halves plus 7. And we are done with that. All right, well, we're kind of zooming along. And I know uh, if you know that if this is going too fast, then you need to stop it. You need to back up. Uh, but I know I get complaints about time. And I know time you can be in control of if I move it along. So that's what I'm doing. <clears throat> All right. Now, this is incredibly disgusting. This is like really, really ugly. And part of the problem is, is that how in the heck do you do antiderivative of that? Well, if you notice, the instructions changed a little bit. Okay, so let me pop back over here. This said, solve the differential equation. Okay, well, this says, represent the solution of the initial value problem using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, so... One way to get the y from this is that whole uh, chunk of the fundamental theorem of calculus that basically says I can do the derivative, um, I'm sorry, that the antiderivative is the integral and all that kind of stuff. Okay, So what I'm going to do is rewrite y 
as the integral from something to something. Well, the something is that initial x value. Now, this does go back to section 5.4 in the book, uh, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus section. We've done this. We did like maybe two little problems, and that's probably all we'll do for this too, So, but you need to be aware of it. You need to know how it works, okay? And so this x value becomes one of the limits of integration, two, and then the other limit of integration is just x. And then if you recall, what we have to do is rewrite this in here, but we just can't use x in here. So usually we use t. And then the whole idea is that as I do these, this integral, it adds on a bunch of y values, and it adds it on to this initial y value. Okay. So I know that seems like magical. We spent a lot of time doing like derivatives of this and going back to this. Okay. So same idea. Now some of you may rather write this so that it's clear that the excuse me, that the plus 9 is on the outside, some people would rather write a 9 plus, and you're certainly welcome to do that. From the initial x value to x, and then just write the function, but don't write the function with x in it. It has to be something other than x. Okay, so you could use u and du. That would be fine. Okay? All right, well, let's just throw one more in here, just like that last one, just so we have a, a better idea. So, uh, sorry about the handwriting, but, you know, Sorry, right. it's all good. <clears throat> so again, the idea is that we're going to do we're going to do y equals, and y equals is based on the integral of the derivative. Okay, so the integral of the derivative. We're going to start from the x value that we start at, the initial x value. We're going to go to whatever x is, whatever this function is, gets written in here. The only catch is that we can't write it with x because the x is taking on a different meaning temporarily. Okay, and then we need to tack on the y value that goes with it. Okay, so in this case, it's a negative 2, so plus negative 2 or minus 2. So again, the idea is this is about slope. This is accumulating a change in y, and this will make even more sense when we talk about Euler's method in the next one. Uh, but this is basically accumulating a y value as we add up all the little slopes times the change in whatever we're, you know, horizontally moving. And all of that gets, so this is our change in y, and then all of that gets added on to our initial y value. Okay, in this case, the y value from when x is 1. So I know that I'm trying to get you to understand what this means, because in the next uh, little chunk, this will actually make more sense. Okay? So that's it uh, that we're going to deal with. There are basically three parts to section 6.1. The first part was about slope fields. The, this part was about uh, solving, analytic, uh, solving analytically uh, the differential equations, and then we're going to use a numerical method that's based on linearization again, kind of, kind of vaguely, kind of like uh, Newton's method. Only it, it's Euler's method. It's a, it's another idea, but it's, it's, uh, we'll, we'll deal with it. It's a numerical approach to uh, mapping out uh, equations. So, all right. Well, with that in mind, I can't believe it's under 20 minutes. I'm quite excited. Uh, Sanford flip math. We're out of here.